Welcome we're to a look ahead. We are delighted you've decided to join us. We studied the Sabbath School lessons as prepared by the Seventh-day Adventist Church. And this series is entitled Themes from the Gospel of John. And you, I'm sure, understand that John is full of marvelous statements. This particular lesson, lesson number four for October 26 of 2024, is entitled Witnesses of Christ as the Messiah. Witnesses of Christ as the Messiah. What kind of witnesses do we have? Let's begin with a word of prayer. Father, we have come to discuss the best we're able how the witnesses recorded in Scripture have led us to see the truth about you. May we understand it, and may those who listen in be led to understand it more clearly is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. As we have discussed, uh, the Jews believe that the Messiah was coming to be their king and to lead them against the Romans. So Jesus had the challenging job of convincing them that not only was he the Messiah that, they had, been that had been prophesied in the Old Testament, but also that his kingdom was very different from what they were expecting. Part of that challenge was to prove that he was, in fact, divine. That was largely a part of our discussion last week in our previous lesson. So what do you think it would take to conv convince a Jew in Jesus' day, or you in 2024, to believe that Jesus was the divine Son of God? Several times Jesus said, those who believe in me have eternal life. One example is John 6, 47. So, but Jesus' life provided much more evidence. Jim? The Bible study guide. But there is more turning water into wine, feeding thousands of, with a few loaves of bread, healing the nobleman's son, restoring the man at the pool of Bethesda, giving sight to the one blind from birth, raising Lazarus from dead. <laughs> The evangelist calls on a variety of events and people, Jew, Gentile, rich, poor, male, female, rulers, commoners, educated and uneducated, to bear witness to who Jesus is from the Bible study guide. Wow. One of the first pieces of evidence that the Gospel of John gives us is from John the Baptist. While most of the Jews were looking for a Messiah to come and lead them against the Romans, and eventually to rule the world, of course, some Jews actually thought there might be two messiahs. One, priestly messiah who would do the spiritual things, and two, the other royal messiah who would conquer the Romans. John the Baptist's ministry began about six months before the start of the ministry of Jesus. As people flocked to the desert to listen to John, it was not long before the religious leaders sent people to question him about who he was and why he was baptizing. His response is found in John 1, 6, to 9 and verse 20. God sent his messenger, a man named John, who came to tell his people about the light so that all who share should hear the message and believe he himself was not the light. He came to tell about the light. This was the real light, the light that comes into the world and shines on everyone. John did not refuse to answer but spoke out openly and clearly saying, I am not the Messiah from the Bible, uh, American Bible Society. The Good News Translation. Yeah, the Good News Translation. But apparently as they were questioning John, Jesus already had appeared in the crowd. He looked no different from any of the other people who had assembled there. Lorna? John 1, 26 and 33. John answered, I baptize with water, but among you stands the one you do not know. I still did not know that he was the one, but God who sent me to baptize with water had said to me, you will see the spirit come down and stay on a man. He is the one who baptizes with the Holy Spirit. Okay. Helen White told us specifically that Jesus and John the Baptist had not had any contact with each other in their first 30 years of life. That's Desire of Ages 109, paragraph 2. John had been told that he would see the Spirit coming down and alighting on the Messiah. 
when that time came, Jesus was the one who had that experience. Now, the question I have, reading the passages I've been to it several times, did Jesus, I mean, did John see someone coming down on Jesus first? And so, okay, he's the guy. Did, and was that before the actual, actual baptism? Or did the Holy Spirit just come down on Jesus at the baptism and that's when he knew? Well, did Jesus come up to John to be baptized? Mm -hmm. So then he, he would have been the one that made the move, first move, and then it was confirmed. Yeah, but John was told in advance that he would see the Holy Spirit descending upon Jesus. Yeah. My question is, did that happen while Jesus was still in the crowd, or did it only happen at the time Jesus was, was baptized? That, well, I thought that was, wasn't that in the form of the dove after he was baptized? Well, that was in the form of the dove, but was, was there a separate time to first identify John the Baptist? I mean, first identify Jesus in the eyes of John the Baptist. And how would John know what the Holy Spirit looked like? Yeah. Well, that, that's, well, we don't know. Those are the questions. <laughs> yeah. John simply stated that he had come to prepare the way for the Messiah. Malachi tells us that especially Elijah was to come before the great and awful day of God. Jesus suggested that John was the Elijah in his day. Who is or are the Elijah, Eli, who is or are Elijah or Elijahs before the great and terrible day of the Lord? Is that not those of us who are Seventh-day Adventists and have agreed to carry the three angels' messages to the world? How well are we doing? Hmm. How do you feel about the testimony of John the Baptist when he said that Jesus was the Lamb of God which taketh away the sin of the world? So from the Bible study guide, the Jews in the time of Christ had their own ideas about the coming Messiah, and they were adamant that everything fit into their neatly packaged scheme. They suspected that John the Baptist was perhaps a Messiah type, but he testified he was only a forerunner of the true Messiah, sent prophetically by God to prepare the way for him. Soon after, John pointed to Jesus as the Lamb of God, but Jesus and his sacrifice for our sins did not align with the Jewish leader's expectation of a royal earthly Messiah who would defeat their oppressors and rule over them and eventually the world. <clears throat> from our Bible study guide. We do not know if there was a separate appearance of the Holy Spirit over Jesus before he was baptized that identified him to John. However, we do know about the descent of the Holy Spirit at the time of Jesus' baptism. This, this and from our Bible study guide, the statement of the Baptist regarding Jesus as the Lamb of God supports the purpose of John's gospel, which is to bring about a renewed understanding of the work and nature of the Messiah. Jesus would indeed be the fulfillment of the promise of the sacrificial system, going back to the promise of the Redeemer first given to Adam and Eve in Genesis 3.15. So, Genesis 3.15, what does that say? Jim, I think that's yours. Then the Lord God said to the snake, I will make you and the woman hate each other. Her offspring and yours will always be enemies. Her offspring will crush your head and you will bite her Offspring's Heal from the Good News Bible. Had a great aunt that didn't even want to touch a, a stuffed snake because it would just <laughs> yeah. drive her nuts. Yeah. So what is the, quote, promise of the sacrificial system? Does crushing the servant's head mean the destruction of the devil? That's sort of what's implied, isn't it? Uh, I thought so, yeah. How is that related to the sacrificial system? Well, there's a very interesting challenge to this idea, which was not in the Bible study guide. You want to start with that, Larry? Okay, Hebrews 10, verses 1 through 11. The Jewish law is not a full and faithful model of the real things. It is only a faint outline of the good things to come. The same sacrifices are offered forever, year after year. How can the law, then, by mean of these sacrifices make perfect the people who come to God? If the people worshiping God had really been purified from their sins, they would not feel guilty of sin anymore, and all sacrifices would actually stop. As it is, however, the sacrifices serve year after year to remind people of their sins, for the blood of bulls and goats can never take away sins, 
For this reason, when God was about to come into the world, he said to God, you do not want sacrifices and offerings, but you have prepared a body for me. You're not, you are not pleased with animals burnt whole on the altar or with sacrifices to take away sins. Then I said, here I am. Do your will, O God, just as it is written of me in the book of the law. First he said, you neither want nor are you pleased with sacrifices and offerings or with animals burnt on the altar and sacrifices to take away sins. He said, even this, even though these sacrifices are offered according to the law. Then he said, here I am, O God, do your will. So God does away with all of the old sacrifices and put the sacrifice of Christ in their place. Because Jesus Christ did what God wanted him to do, we are all purified from sin by the offering that he made of his body once and for all. Every Jewish priest performs his services every day and offers the same sacrifices many times. But these sacrifices can never take away sins. Okay. Good, from the Good News Bible. So what are the promises of the sacrificial system? Jesus is coming. <laughs> yeah. Do you agree with the following which is taken from our Bible study guide, Lorna? Today, some skeptics do not have much regard for the biblical concept of sacrifice either. They point to Christ's sacrifice to justify their indifference. These skeptics say that Jesus did not need to shed his blood to save sinful humanity, for he could have saved us simply through a demonstration of his love and by the performance of miracles. But life, as the Bible tells us, is in the blood, and lost humanity needed the life that is in the Son. Angels could not have accomplished this feat on behalf of humanity because they borrowed life from the possessor of life. Why else would God have commanded countless sacrifices of innocent animals if not to point to the necessity of Christ's innocent blood for the remission of sin and the giving of eternal life? I have it's, it's a good, it's a reasonable question because of the misuse, why did God do it in the first place? Yeah. Of course, then that, it probably that whatever approach God did, Satan would take advantage and misuse it. So, so that would be my response to that. Mm -hmm. Well, the point is that, that God's plan from the very beginning, when Adam and Eve offered that first sacrifice, and I'm sure it just made them feel terrible, God was saying, okay, every time someone kills an animal, I hope that that will be the response to realize how awful it sin. It became so rote, you know, yeah. they'd be just, day after day after day, it, I, I'm sure it just lost its meaning. Here yeah. we go again. Well, you know. They got desensitized because of the repetition. So, yeah. so that's the other question. I mean, it's like multiple, multiple times a day for each person. Yeah. Is that, is, is, but is that a right? Well, uh, it wasn't it was possible the totality because that, they, had, they had to go to Jerusalem in order to offer these sacrifices. So they couldn't do that anyway. How was John the Baptist impacted by the main manifestation of the Holy Spirit as a dove coming down on Jesus? Where are we? Me? Yeah. So Ellen White. When at the baptism of Jesus, John pointed to him as the Lamb of God, a new light was shed upon the Messiah's work. The prophet's mind was directed to the words of Isaiah. He is brought as a lamb to the slaughter. During the weeks that followed, John with new interest studied the prophecies and the teaching of the sacrificial service. He did not distinguish clearly the two phases of Christ's work as a suffering sacrifice and a conquering king, but he saw that his coming had a deeper significance than priests or people had discerned. When he beheld Jesus among the throng on his return from the desert, he confidently looked for him to give the people some sign of his true character. Almost impatiently, he waited to hear the Savior declare his mission, but no word was spoken, no sign given. 
Jesus did not respond to the Baptist's announcement of him, but mingled with the disciples of John, giving no outward evidence of his special work and taking no measure to bring himself to notice. Wow. Notice these words from Paul, trying to figure out how we relate to this situation. Romans 5, verse 6, For when we were still helpless, Christ died for the wicked at the time that God chose. Was Paul including himself among the wicked for whom Christ died? For when we were still helpless, was that? Anyway, 1 Peter 2, 12, 24. Why, why are you asking that? It sort of seems self-evident. Yeah. But, but is there another subtler? No, I, okay. I, I just want to make sure that, that, that that's clear. Well, he okay. recognizes his own sins. Yeah. 1 Peter 2, 24, Christ himself carried our sins in his body to the cross so that we might die to sin and live for righteousness if it is by his wounds that you have been healed. Now, that one's a little harder for me to understand why Peter would say that. Yeah, because I thought people can't, can't save your, your sins from being somebody else. You can't, you can't put sins, you can't take our sins and put it on Jesus. Yeah. So, yeah. How does Christ carrying our sins in his body to the cross help us to die to sin and live for righteousness? Well, the real truth of that is that Christ died to demonstrate what sin does. You know, sin pays its wage death. Well, again, rightly understood, because if Jesus is reacting and zapping people because he's so angry that you rebelled against him, or he's <laughs> trying to warn us, yeah. Be careful if you if you don't cooperate, if you are rebellious, if you're selfish, it's going to damage you. Yeah. I think that's a mis a poor translation on 1 Peter 2:20. Well, every every translation every again words um, have yeah. to be yeah. understood properly. So whatever words there are can be twisted. Yeah, and this is the good news good news yeah. version of it. This is there's other, better ways to say it. I, I chose the good news because it's accepted by almost all denominations and is supposed to be presented in most, the simplest, well, most straightforward man, language. Well, there's a manuscript of Ellen White about this when in a great controversy in heaven that now when God was trying to explain things, everything was, everything was being examined and evaluated and what's he trying to say and how come he's saying it this way? So when you have a, a debate and a controversy and distrust, then all, words and motives can be distrusted. Mm -hmm. Jesus died to show us what sin does to people. He died the second death, which is a result of sin, separating us from God, the source of life. Okay, Revelation 5, 6, I think it's yours, Jim. Then I saw a lamb standing in the center of the throne, surrounded by four living creatures, and and the elders. The lamb appeared to have been killed. It had, been, it had seven horns and seven eyes, which are the seven spirits of God that have been sent throughout the whole earth. The lamb went and took the scroll from the right hand of the one who sits on the throne. He did it so the four living creatures and the 24 elders fell down before the lamb. Each had a harp and golden, gold bowls filled with incense which are the prayers of the God's people. They sang a new song. You are worthy to take the scroll and to break open its seals, for you were killed, and by your sacrificial death you brought, you, you bought, bought for God. Wow. People from every tribe and language, nation and range, race, you have made them a kingdom of priests to serve our God, and they shall rule on the earth on earth. Again, I looked and I heard angels, thousands and millions of them. They stood around the throne and the four living creatures and the elders and sang in a loud voice. The lamb who was killed is worthy to receive power, wealth, wisdom and strength, honor, glory and praise. And I heard every creature in heaven, on earth, in the world below and in the sea, all living, thing, all living beings in the universe, and they were singing, to him who sits on the throne and to the Lamb, be praised and honor, glory and might forever and ever. I'm going to interrupt for just a second. Does that include Satan and all his angels? 
we, well, there'll be an aspect what that's forced from him that he has to acknowledge, but it's not a it's not a changing awareness. It doesn't no. change it, but it'll be he has he it's forced from his lips. And it says every creature. I was wondering if that refers to animals too. that suddenly mm. become have voices. Uh, I think that'd be stretching it. I'd be stretching it, but it says every creature. Uh, the four yeah, living creatures every... answered. Le re go ahead. The four yeah. living creatures answered, Amen, and the ed elders fell down and worshipped. All right. Um, well, what's the word, word creature? What, what does that represent? Yeah. Well, that, does that solve yeah, that? From the original. Yeah, this lamb, well, it, it a created being. That's what it says. It's, it, okay. This lamb will demonstrate the truth to all beings, including Satan himself, and Satan will be down on his knees, admitting that God has done what is right. Yes, uh, Larry, I think okay. that's your... Philippians 2, verses 9 through 11. For this reason, God raised him to the highest place above and gave him the name that is greater than any other name. And so, in honor of the name of Jesus, all beings in heaven, on earth, and in the world below will fall on their knees, and all will openly proclaim that Jesus Christ is Lord, to the glory of God the Father. Clearly, this lamb, well, and, and I mean, how, how could that not include Satan? Yeah, one well, so. It's like the confession of Achan. So Achan admitted yeah. it, but it, it didn't change him. Yeah, no, that, I'm not arguing about that. Yeah. Clearly, this lamb is to defeat the devil and on God's behalf to win the great controversy over God's character and government. So what did Jesus himself say, Jesus himself say about that question? While we should be convinced on the basis of the testimonies of these witnesses, Jesus Christ himself made it very clear that sin leads to separation from God. He died in the Garden of Gethsemane to demonstrate to the onlooking universe what the results of sin are. And that was before any human had touched him or caused him to shed any blood. He died a second time on the cross so that we humans could get at least some idea of what was involved. Several of the disciples of John the Baptist were attracted to Jesus because of John's words. When Jesus was pointed out, they followed him and, and learned about him and were convinced. We've already suggested that James and John were probably cousins of Jesus. That means that they could also have been cousins of John the Baptist. Remember this very interesting paragraph from Ellen White? Anna? He, Jesus, had been separated from his mother for quite a length of time. During this period, he had been baptized by John and had endured the temptations in the wilderness. Rumors had reached Mary concerning her son and his sufferings. John, one of the new disciples, had searched for Christ and had found him in his humiliation, emaciated and bearing the marks of great physical and mental distress. Jesus, unwilling that John should witness his humiliation, had gently yet firmly dismissed him from his presence. He wished to be alone. No human eye must behold his agony. No human heart be called out in sympathy with his distress. Clearly, John and Andrew were willing to go the extra mile to find out everything they could about Jesus. Mickey? If John and Andrew had possessed the unbelieving spirit of the priests and rulers, they would not have been found as learners at the feet of Jesus. They would have come to him. Oh, I'm sorry, yeah. Oh, yeah. That's my cursor that... Can you move it over to the right margin? Yeah. yeah. They would have come to him as critics to judge his words. Many thus closed the door to the most precious opportunities. But not so did these first disciples. They would responded to the Holy Spirit's call in the preaching of John the Baptist. Now they recognized the voice of the heavenly teacher. To them the words of Jesus were full of freshness and truth and beauty. A divine illumination was shed upon the teaching of the Old Testament scriptures. The many cited themes of truth stood out in a new light. Desire of Ages 139. How would you be impacted if you saw a dove obviously descending from heaven and landing on Jesus, representing the Holy Spirit coming upon Jesus? Now, if you were in one of the main 
areas in New York City where there are so many <laughs> yeah, because pigeons. Yeah, well, it's just not a regular garden variety <laughs> yeah. dove. Or did, it have, or, did a dove have some significance to the pe onlookers at that time? Well, that it's we hard know to know. Okay. And this was obviously a being of light and glory. I mean, it must have been. And identifying these future disciples, Jesus showed that he had foreknowledge of each one of us in detail. How much does Jesus know about each one of us? Well, I just wanted to, so part of the issue, Satan was tempting God, uh, Jesus by his appearance that maybe he was the fallen angel. Mm -hmm. So the, the significant, it would have been more significant to Jesus to have that uh, approval from God that, no, you really mm -hmm. are my son and you're the one. So, so that would have been to me the significance. So John 1, 41 and 42, at once he found his brother Simon, this is uh, the disciples, Simon Peter, and told him, we have found the Messiah. This word means Christ. Then he took Simon to Jesus. I mean, you know, they have been looking for the Messiah for 400 years. I mean, yeah. Jesus. But, but their version of the Messiah. Yeah, well, the Messiah. But they knew something. Well, there's a lot of evidence that something was afoot right yeah. now, right? Jesus looked at him and said, your name is Simon, son of John, but you will be called Cephas. This is the same as Peter and means a rock. Jesus uh, could look into the character of people and know what their real motives were. This was in calling, this was in calling disciples as well as at other times. Jim? John 2, verses 23 to 25. While Jesus was in Jerusalem during the Passover festival, many believed in him as they saw the miracles he performed, but Jesus did not trust himself to them because he knew them all. There was no need for anyone to tell him about them because he himself knew what was in their hearts, that is their motives or true thoughts from the Good News Bible. It was at that same Passover that Jesus cleansed the temple for the first time. When the religious leaders questioned him about who gave him the authority to do what he did, he told them that if they destroyed this temple, his body, we now know, he would raise it back up again. And we have two passages there, John 2:19. 2, Jesus answered, tear down this temple and in three days I will build it again. Later he said, John 10, 18, no one takes my life away from me. I give it up of my own free will. I have the right to give it up and I have the right to take it back. This is what my father has commanded me to do. The final irrefutable proof of his divinity was given after the religious leaders had killed him on the cross and buried him. Christ arose from the dead by the power that was in himself. From Ellen White, when the voice of the mighty angel was heard at Christ's tomb saying, thy father calls thee, the Savior came forth from the grave in his life by the, by life. the life uh, that was in himself. Now he proved the truth of his own words. I lay down my life that I might take it up again. I have power to lay it down and I have power to take it up again. Now was fulfilled the prophecy. He had spoken to the priests and the rulers, destroy this temple and in three days I will rise it up again. That comes from John 10, 17 and elsewhere. And if, if the disciples had invented this story, more than likely, um, I think Miguel told me this, that they would have just come up with the idea that it was a spirit that came back, it was Jesus' spirit, because that was more in line with their thinking. So yeah. the idea that he would come back in bodily form was a preposterous idea that they would have never even thought of themselves and nobody would believe him. So, so that's another evidence that this really happened. Philip and Nathaniel were two more of the disciples who were early followers of Jesus. Lorna? John 1, 43 to 46. The next day Jesus decided to go to Galilee. He found Philip and said to him, come with me. Philip was from Bethsaida, the town where Andrew and Peter lived. Philip found Nathanael and told him, we have found the one whom Moses wrote about in the book of the law and whom the prophets also wrote about. He is Jesus, son of Joseph from Nazareth. Can anything good come from Nazareth? Nathaniel <laughs> asked. Come and see, answered Philip. That's the right answer. Come and see for yourself. Yeah. So you think he said that on purpose to kind of get him to question it? Or did he 
was he a and, little and bit? And by the way, he's from Nazareth. Yeah, yeah. which is low income. Yeah, whatever. nobody would. Yeah. Are you are you kidding me? It's the wrong that, side of the tracks. Yeah. yeah, they wanted to give him an easy way out. If he really wasn't interested, <laughs> they told him that so he would know. Nathaniel was surprised to think that anything good could come out of Nazareth. Mickey. The Bible study guide says Nathaniel seems to have been prejudiced against the little town of Nazareth. Surely really? <laughs> a king would not come from such a wayside location. And it was a small town, too. Yeah. Prejudice easily blinds the eyes from seeing people for what they are really worth. Philip seems to have recognized possibly from previous conversations with Nathaniel that the proper way to deal with prejudice is not some exalted philosophical or theological argumentation but rather just invite the individual to experience the truth personally for themselves. He simply said, well, come and check it out for yourself. <laughs> and that is exactly what Nathaniel did. He went and saw. From our Bible study guide. So what did these first disciples see when they came to Jesus? John 1, 47 to 51, when Jesus saw Nathaniel coming to him, he said about him, here's a real Israelite. There is nothing false in him. Nathaniel asked him, how did you know me? Jesus answered, I saw you when you were under the fig tree before Philip called you. Teacher answered Nathaniel, you are the son of God, you are the king of Israel. Now, I'm, you know, when I, every time I read that statement, wow. Yeah, that's I mean, all just said? from that, <laughs> that thing, Jesus said, do you believe just because I told you I saw you when you were under the fig tree? You will see much greater things than this. And he said to them, I am telling you the truth. You will see heaven open and God's angels going up and coming down on the Son of Man. So when was that? Jacob. No. Oh. Well, it sounds like, sounds like he's saying that this would be true about... Transfiguration, maybe? Maybe, but only three of them saw that. Yeah. So... Probably have to be the ascension, maybe. Mm. Well, he said going up and coming down. So. Yeah. And I didn't see the ascension had all the angels there. Was, was, that, was there angels there? Yeah, I remember two of them yeah, came down and told the, the, the disciples, hey, you know. Yeah, well, I because. remember that part. But I mean, as far as many angels. Yeah. Well, it says they came down from the cloud. Yeah, okay. But this is invoking the Jacob's dream, wasn't it? Well, it sounds like it, yeah. So you think it's not? No. Well, it, sa it says Jesus. you will see heaven open. The disciples okay. would see that. Right. Not from the historical stories. Right, okay. The important thing is that Nathaniel followed Philip's invitation to go and see Jesus. Ellen White tells us the full story in Desire of Ages 140, pages 1 to, I mean, uh, paragraphs 1 through 5, which of course we don't have time to read right now. At the first Passover during Jesus' ministry, Nicodemus came to him at night. See John 3, and that's very famous area. Nicodemus asserted that he had seen a lot of miracles and this was convincing evidence that Jesus was the Messiah. Now this is the first Passover and Nicodemus was located in, in Jerusalem. How many miracles had Jesus performed in Jerusalem already? Not many. Any? Well, this was after the cleansing of the temple? Well, still, was the first cleansing of the temple was as his very first visit to, to, to the Passover. Well, and so as part of that conversion, uh, but he certainly wanted to know more. And so as part of that conversion, Jesus told Nicodemus that he must be born again, taking on a huge new change in his life. Jesus also said that even the Jews would be judged in that final judgment based on what they had done. Those who love darkness would be allowed to go to darkness, while those who love the light would come to God. In this gospel, John focused more on individual encounters which Jesus had with separate individuals than did the other gospel writers. Think of the impact that the encounter with Nicodemus has had on the lives of Christians down through the generations. <coughs> Jim, I guess you're next. Nicodemus was a Pharisee and an important member of the Sanhedrin, which served as the highest judicial system in Judaism, close, closest to home rule. The word Sanhedrin comes from the Greek word synedrion, 
which literally means a council. It was composed of 71 members comprised of three divisions according to Matthew 27, 41 as follows. Chief priests, the ruling high priest, retired high priests, and high priestly family members. This block was mostly Sadducees, scribes, predominantly Pharisees, elders who were representatives of chief aristocratic families, and the office of the chief high priest had become corrupt and was often bought and sold by Rome to the highest bidder from the Bible study guide. Isn't that incredible? Jesus might seem to have been very gruff in his response to Nicodemus. Of course, we do not have the full conversation or the details of their meeting recorded in John 3. However, Jesus knew exactly what Nicodemus needed to learn, and he went straight to the point. The important thing for us to know is that the, right, the night vision with Jesus was the evidence that Nicodemus needed, and he committed his life from that point on to supporting Jesus, although not publicly until Jesus' death. Nicodemus had a new a paradigm. Just as John took a whole new approach to his understanding of the mission of Jesus after his experience with Jesus, Nicodemus took a whole new approach to his understanding of Scripture. He developed a new paradigm. Okay, from Ellen White. He, meaning Nicodemus, searched the scriptures in a new way, not for the discussion of a theory, but in order to receive life for the soul. He began to see the kingdom of heaven as he submitted himself to the leading of the Holy Spirit. There are thousands today who need to learn the same truth that was taught to Nicodemus by the uplifted serpent. They depend on their obedience to the law of God to command. Command. Them, command. To, oh, to command. Okay. To command them to his favor. They, when they are bidden to look at, to Jesus and believe that he saves them solely through his grace, they exclaim, how can these things be? Like Nicodemus, we must be willing to enter into the life of the same way as the chief of sinners. Then Christ, there is none other name, other heaven uh, given among men, whereby we must be saved. That comes from Acts 4, verse 12. Though faith, we, through faith, we receive the grace of God. But faith is not our Savior. It earns nothing. It is the hand by which we lay upon, upon Christ and appropriate uh, his merits, uh, the remedy for sin. How does that work? And we cannot even repent without the aid of the Spirit of God. The scripture says of Christ, him hath God exalted with him his right hand to be the prince and the savior, to give him uh, repentance to Israel and forgiveness of sins. That comes from Acts 5, verses 31. So it's an interesting statement that LOI makes that it's through the same act of the mind that truth or error is received into it. So it's, it, so it's some times we shouldn't want more faith, we should want less. Yeah, well, so it depends on what it is that we actually have faith in that is the key, not yeah. whether we have faith. And, and what we're basing our faith on. Well, right. we're that's that's the, the point, is that it's what it's in or on. Yeah. That is the key point. Yeah. Instead of using the word faith, use the word uh, persuasion. Jesus taught, it, it used words to persuade. Or but to it, educate. It's educate, of course. Yeah, and, and, what is, and what evidence are we using to base that faith on? Mm -hmm. Jesus was a teacher and not a penalty payer. Well, you, want, you want forgiven people running around still, because you don't learn anything just with forgiveness. You have to rationally. Well, you could learn. Uh, I mean, again, if you if you're forgiven, that invokes love on on your part. Yeah, but it's it's like if a person you let somebody get away with something, uh, it it sends the wrong message. Well, see, <clears throat> it, it depends how it's received. Mm -hmm. If you say, "Oh, I got off the hook," or if, "Oh, that was very gracious on your part to forgive me." not hold it against me. Yeah, mm -hmm. but <laughs> human nature being what it is, it... Well, that was uh, the effect on Mary. Yeah, I can, can continue. 
Um, how then are we to be saved? As Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, so the Son of Man has been lifted up, and everyone who has been deceived and bitten by the serpent may look up and live. Behold the Lamb of God, which taketh away the sin of the world, from John 1, verses 29. The light shining from the cross reveals the love of God. His love is drawing us to himself. If we do not resist this drawing, we shall be led to the foot of the cross in repentance for the sins that have crucified the Savior. Then the Spirit of God, through faith, uh, produces a new life in the soul. The thoughts and desires are brought into obedience to the will of Christ. The heart, the mind, are created anew in the image of him who works in us to subdue all things to himself. Then the law of God is written in the mind and heart, and we can say with Christ, I delight to do thy will, O God. That's from Psalms 40, verse 8. Okay, from, from quoting from Desire of Ages. So, <clears throat> how does this kind of transformations we're talking about here, I, I try to, I think of these, I try to put myself in the place of these disciples and, and others that I read about in these Bible stories. And like Nathaniel, oh, you saw me under, th obviously you must be the son of God. He must have had second thoughts. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, I don't know. If, you know Say more? What, what do you mean? Well, I mean, did he, did he question anything? I mean, here, here, here it is. This is at the very beginning of Christ's experience with the disciples. He hasn't even chosen his 12 yet. And Philip, clear at the end of the thing, is still sort of questioning. Well, yeah, yeah. I'm just... Do we get, so, Nathaniel, do we get any other evidence of doubt or skepticism? No, or? we don't. But I'm just thinking, I mean, was Nathaniel gullible? I mean... Well, he probably had multiple influences, so he's trying to tease all those out to say, yeah. what do I really believe? Because there's people speaking from different directions. Well, that, the fact that he was under a tree, that Jesus had to know that. So, mm -hmm. so that was sort of, how did you know that? Yeah, exactly. Well, and we're, we're, we're going to study about others, because I've already worked ahead a little ways on these lessons. We're going to see others who decided, I mean, like the woman at, at, at Samaria, you know, the, the right. well, Joseph's well. I mean, you know, I am the Messiah. Okay, well, let me go and convert my whole village. <laughs> you know, he makes, I mean, sure, that's a, that's a horrendous, I mean, that's a tremendous statement. He told things that she well, he said, know, how can you possibly yeah. know that? I would say he, he knows just what it takes. I had a fellow that questioned God's existence and uh, his sister said, well, just, just be open. If, let him figure out how he's going to convince you. So I thought that made sense. So the next day he's walking to the VA, something sticks in the bottom of, is on the bottom of his foot. So he sits down, looks at it as a pin that says, God loves you. <laughs> and so he had this whole conversion experience. A sign. <laughs> and I said, well, you're easy. Yeah. That's all it took. So I had to chuckle. God knows just the little amount that it takes to convince you. That's quite a story. Well, I mean, but I mean, if you, if you go through this whole series, we're, we've been a couple lessons now talking about, okay, why do you believe this? Why do you believe that? And yet some people just the tiny little thing. And, and I'm not, I'm not knocking them. I, I, I think that was, they made the right decision. Just what they needed at the time. Right. Yeah. So what do you think Jesus specifically meant when he said we must be born again? We've talked about that a lot. It's that I mean, radical of a difference that it's as if you became born again. That's, that's how different it is. It's a total new paradigm. That's how I would say it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. A new paradigm is probably... That's a well described. Good description. Why would that be so important in the mind of Jesus? When someone is converted to become a Christian and follower of Jesus, the transformation is like being born again. Have you seen that in the life of yourself or others? I mean, some examples. Uh, I, many years ago, I, I grew up in Idaho, and many years ago there was that man who 
shot the governor and was in Harry you know, Orchard. Harry Orchard and uh, in, in prison for life. And he was just a. Uh, and one Adventist guy decided to make regular visits to him. And, you know, he ended up being. I think Kamal, the governor's wife. Yeah. His governor's well, finally wife. Finally, did, yeah. Worked on there. Yeah. And, and uh, he lived on the. Uh, he had a separate shack or separate yeah. house there on the on the prison grounds. Yeah, end up what looked like a becoming a becoming a saint. Real conversion. Yeah. yeah. Can we as human beings tell when a person has been born again? So say that again. Can we as human beings tell when a person has been born again? You mean depends the exact how much moment? Depends how much we can contact. See evidence, yeah, the manifestations. Like C.S. Lewis, I think, said it's more important what we are than what we do, but we can tell what we are by what we do. <laughs> yeah, you know, that's interesting. You, you read the, uh, with the story of Cain. He says, if you were, if you are, you won't be su suffering this, uh, this condition. And rather, it, it's you are as you as you think it, you are. What you yeah. are and, always and becomes manifest. It isn't about what you're doing. It's but you're thinking. It's, mm -hmm. Sin starts right here. It always comes out. Yeah. Well, after Jesus' crucifixion, Nicodemus publicly became a follower of Jesus, and he became a great financial support of the early church. This, of course, is from Ellen White. We don't have this from the Bible. Uh, where are we? Um, I think Lauren. Oh. Lauren, yeah. Uh, from Ellen White. After the Lord's ascension, when the disciples were scattered by persecution, Nicodemus came boldly to the front. He employed his wealth in sustaining the infant church that the Jews had expected to be blotted out at the death of Christ. Let me interrupt for just a second. Okay, who else was a member of the Sanhedrin and went through some of these experiences, and then com his life completely changed. What, I mean, Paul. Paul? Oh, of course, Paul's an example, another example. Uh, amazing that, I mean, these are, these are people who, are, I mean, we sort of categorize the, the Jewish leaders as critics. Oh, that's why I like that, that great company of priests were converted, so. Yeah, Acts 6, verse 7, yeah. It wasn't the rare exception, necessarily. Yeah. Well, that, that's, <clears throat> that should give us a little bit more encouragement about these people who were seem, right. seem to be so critical back at the beginning. Well, Elijah has, you know, he, he questioned whether anybody else, and so in every age, we have to be careful about thinking we're the only one. Yeah. When they talk about the Messiah or the, the Anointed One coming, they, sometimes they refer to Elijah, don't they? Well, uh, Elijah's one who's supposed to come before that person. But the name Elijah yeah, is yeah. Yahweh is God. Yeah. Yahweh is El. Yahweh is God. But there's three things that they referred to. They talked about a prophet, Moses' prediction, a prophet like me is coming. Mm -hmm. And then, of course, the Yahweh, I mean, the, uh, uh, Jeremiah talks about the potter and so forth and something like that. And then, of course, Malachi ends up by saying before the great day of the terrible day of the Lord, you know, um, Elijah's going to come. So they had several, when Jesus asked them, well, what do you say? Well, they said, you know, Moses and Elijah and so forth like that. So, yeah, they had those ideas. Um, okay. Lorna? In the, <clears throat> in the time of peril, he who had been so cautious and questioning was firm as a rock encouraging the face of the disciples and furnishing means to carry forward the work of the gospel. Now let he, me interrupt again for a second. I'm sorry, but here's a person who was a leading member of the Sanhedrin and now he's a leading member of the Christian church. How did he relate to the other members of the Sanhedrin? They would probably kind of set him outside. You know, you're kind of now fringe of this group of 71, hmm. you're now over here. <laughs> I wonder if well, they'd allowed him still to participate. Yeah, Rip Mickey, go ahead. Well, I, I mean, 
it's just speculation. I mean, it could, he was well respected, right? Mm -hmm. So I he mean, had money, maybe, man. Maybe so. Well, that too. <laughs> of course, then maybe he gave it all away, lost his influence. For as long as he had money, he was probably still vital to them. And then yeah. when he lost his money, they were done. Yeah, or certainly ostracized. And okay, well, more, too many interruptions. Go ahead. He was scorned and persecuted by those who had paid him reverence in other days. He became poor in this world's goods. Yet he faltered not in the faith which had its beginning in that night conference with Jesus. And I'm going to interrupt again, I'm sorry. I wonder about, he, he must have been married. In fact, he had to be married to be a member of the Sanhedrin. Why don't we hear anything about his wife or his family? Well, didn't they say that the Sanhedrin was, give that list, and their families? Mm -hmm. Because it said that was part of the list of the members of the Sanhedrin was, mm -hmm. and families. Mm -hmm. So it seemed like at least some of them were married. Yeah, so why, why don't we hear anything about what happened with his wife? John the chose not to mention John chose not wife. to mention it. Okay, I suppose so. Okay, go ahead. Nicodemus related to John the story of that interview, and by his pen, John's, it was recorded for the instruction of millions. The truths there taught are as important today as they were on that solemn night in the shadowy mountain when the Jewish ruler came to learn the way of life from the lowly teacher of Galilee. Yeah. You wonder how he figured out where Jesus was? Who did he ask? <laughs> so forth. In conclusion, what lessons to resist temptation and what encouragement can we take from the experience of Jesus with John the Baptist at the Jordan River? Now, Jesus obviously came down there. He was recognized by John, as we discussed a little bit earlier, whether he, he saw the, something descending on Jesus before his baptism, or at least at the time of his baptism. And that was an encouragement to Jesus, I'm sure, as well. Do we have any evidence that Jesus had any miraculous in interventions earlier in his life? Well, he heard, he heard the voice. He said, this is my son, I'm well, I'm yeah. well pleased. Mm -hmm. So there was that part. If you go back to uh, the two early, well, there are two chapters in Ellen White. One is before the the trip to Jerusalem and one after the trip to Jerusalem where she talks about his childhood and his youth. And she says he was taught by God and the angels. How did that happen? I mean, I'm, I'm just, you know, later on in his life, I, I, I'm fully convinced that every night in his prayer, he and his father planned what they were going to do the next day. Interesting. I'm sure that was Because we usually think that Mary was teaching Jesus, but yeah. the females didn't have the from birth on up going through and memorizing the Bible. So why would she have all the knowledge to teach Jesus? So yeah. I was always concerned about how could Mary be the teacher yeah. when women didn't have that kind of authority to have that experience of all the memorization I, I, that the young boys did. Yeah. Mickey, you well, Jesus was in nature quite a bit too, so. Yeah. But also, what Mary could teach him was about his birth. Yeah. And the and, wise men. And the events. And the that shepherds. And, yeah. you yeah. know, she would, that would be a story she would tell over and yeah, over. Right, right. Yeah. Wow. Cool. Okay. Um, Mickey? So, from Ellen White, and the word that was spoken to Jesus at the Jordan. This is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased, embraces humanity. God spoke to Jesus as our representative with all our sins and weaknesses. We are not cast aside as worthless. He hath made us accepted in the beloved. The glory that rests upon Christ is a pledge of the love of God for us. It tells us of the power of prayer how the human voice may reach the ear of God and our petitions find acceptance in the courts of heaven. By sin, earth was cut off from heaven and alienated from its communion. But Jesus has connected again with the sphere of glory. Can as I interrupt there for a second? Again, the question is, 
earth was cut off from heaven. I mean, think of all the places that God could have chosen. Why did he choose to come and choose, okay, this is going to be my future home. He, every time I think of that, it just blows my mind. He, well, one place Ellen White says, he, ca he, he comes here because this is where the great controversy was won. Well, also in line with, again, we were a new and distinct order. So yeah. I think we were the ones most fully in his image. And um, he, he didn't want, he couldn't, he couldn't destroy, he couldn't bring himself to get rid of us. Uh, because we were most like him. So he, Although they came close to it in the flood. <laughs> yeah. Well, yeah, so but he, he knew starting over. God didn't bring the flood. It let it happen. God is accused well, of doing that to which he does careful not. careful to say God never did anything, because it's pretty hard to come up with a natural consequence for everything. So the 180,000 that were dead in one night? It might be 5,180. There's a problem well, with the way the numbers a, are written. Even that would be just completely beyond but any disease. God is accused of doing that which he does not prevent and that which he allows. Okay. And, well, so the, the for killing of the firstborn. There's no natural consequence that's going to kill the firstborn of animals and humans. So you have to be a little careful that God never did anything. So again, that's the way then we separate to, then that you've got a, is a the first death God. and the no. No, first death and second death then answers that distinction. He doesn't kill the second death, but he might sin, put you to sleep. Sin pays its wage. God does not need to make it any worse, worse than it already is. By, by I, inter my father was an anesthesiologist, and he took care of many people, even open heart surgeries and so forth like this. And basically, he killed people. They were completely dead. If he had walked away, they wouldn't take another breath. But he rose, he, he, he brought them back to life. Mm -hmm. And Jesus will bring back to life every single person who's ever died. Everybody who died in the flood, all the firstborn in Egypt, every one of them will come back to life. So I don't regard that as killing at all. That's putting people to sleep. Yeah. So yeah, you have to make a distinction, first death and second death. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Okay, where were we? Okay, so, okay, so let's, the, um, his love. Okay, he has made it, I'll say, he started. Right. He hath made us accepted in the beloved. The glory that rested upon Christ is a pledge of the love of God for us. It tells us of the power of prayer, how the human voice may reach the ear of God, and our petitions find acceptance in the courts of heaven. By sin, earth was cut off from heaven and alienated from its communion, but Jesus has connected it again with the sphere of glory. We have to cut out, we have to stop right there. Let's pray. Yeah. Our kind and wonderful Father, we thank you for this privilege we have of coming together and discussing these absolutely enormous and very important issues. We, we thank you for the revelations that you have made so that we have some information to go of and that our faith can be based on evidence. These things we pray in the name of Jesus. Amen.